What is up everyone, I'm CBMF Productions, and I come to you all today with a question that has been pondering in my headspace for the past few months or so. This seems to get bigger and more frustrating, that I just need to let all my thoughts spill onto this video. Something that I feel that has become quite the Achilles heel of Marvel's multiverse saga so far, and something that not many people have really talked about that much. And that's the canonical nature of Marvel's Phase 4 so far, and how so many projects due to the nature of this new saga of the MCU, have made so many past Marvel projects canon, and how that's oversaturated the market in a universe where we're already getting a new MCU project damn near every single month now. But let's backtrack a bit and talk about how I've come to this roadblock with my enjoyment of the MCU. Back in the golden days, there was the Infinity Saga, a string of 23 films that spanned over the course of 11 years, divided into three phases, building up so many essential heroes that formed a team together, fought countless enemies, including themselves at one point, and in the end, had to come together to fight the greatest threat in the universe, only to lose, and then regain victory after putting everything at stake, ending up with some heroes sacrificing themselves, some finding a new purpose, and some getting their long deserved happy ending. It was a story that drew audiences in year after year, and because of the storytelling structure, and the cohesive vision of one man in the center of all of it, led the MCU to become the biggest film franchise of all time, at least as of this recording. Now, this is something that everyone who's watching this video has experienced, or at least is familiar with the concept of the Infinity Saga and the MCU. It was a very simple franchise to keep track of, that despite the number of films that eventually grew out, especially in Phase 3, might have put some people at arm's length with the quantity, but every film was a clear building block to the eventual conclusion of Thanos and the Infinity Stones. Every film was an event that felt larger than life, when you went to go see it with a crazy Marvel crowd opening weekend. I know because I've seen every single Marvel movie in theaters since the first Avengers came out all the way back in 2012, and I'm still going to this day. Really, what I'm getting at is that these movies are all you had to watch to understand the whole scope of this Infinity Saga. Yes, there were some extended tie-in stuff like comics, video games, and the Marvel one-shots, which were a collection of short films that were released on home media for certain MCU films back like around Phase 2 or whatever, mostly being an in-joke and filling in some of the gaps that we as fans didn't really realize we needed, or just being goofy for the sake of being goofy. Really, the only Marvel one-shot that you needed to watch was All Hail the King, a short that was made to ease the Marvel fanboys who were angered at the whole Trevor Slattery Mandarin twist in Iron Man 3, and this short was just made to make the Marvel fans clear that there is a real Mandarin out there, which would later be included in Shang-Chi nearly a decade after the short was made, which still shocks me how they tied that in. But the biggest times that didn't really mean a whole lot in the grand scope of things was Marvel Television, headed by one Ike Perlmutter, who was once Kevin Feige's boss at Marvel Studios, which to keep that side of history short and simple, let's just say Perlmutter was not a very good man, and him and Feige would constantly clash with creative choices, almost leading to Kevin Feige walking away from Marvel Studios completely, until the CEO of Disney at the time, Bob Iger, rearranged the corporate structure of Marvel Studios, making Alan Horn, the executive head of all film at Disney at the time, Feige's new boss, and Perlmutter would head a separate division in Marvel TV consisting of a bunch of TV shows that were in quality to say the least. The first major TV series that was made from this division was Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. back in 2013, being the first Marvel property to focus on the previously dead character in Phil Coulson, which has now become a strange trend in MCU's Phase 4 recently. But getting back on track, the series was marketed, especially by one of the executive producers at the time, and the now infamous Joss Whedon, who helmed the first two Avengers films, adamantly saying that everything is connected and that this series would matter in the larger MCU scope. With the series trying to tie in the recent films at the time like Thor The Dark World and Captain America Winter Soldier, and bring in several minor MCU characters have a brief role for an episode like Sif from Thor The Dark World, Dum Dum Dugan from Captain America vs. Avenger, Maria Hill, and even having the Fury show for a couple episodes. But when Captain America The Winter Soldier absolutely burned S.H.I.E.L.D. to the ground, and made it clear that it had no place in the future of the MCU other than the Fallout, and mind you, this movie was released within the first season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s run, so the showrunners have to completely change the show from the ground up, and for the remainder of this impressive seventh season run, it mostly went on its own path, and despite having some crazy concepts like the Inhumans and Ghost Riders showing up, it didn't really tie into the main MCU films, and to this day, we still haven't seen Phil Coulson in the present day, and so he just died from Loki in the first Avengers despite returning to play the character in Captain Marvel, which was a prequel to the early MCU films. The second major attempt was Agent Carter in early 2015, focusing on Peggy Carter's life after her Captain America the first Avenger, where she tries to form S.H.I.E.L.D. from the ground up in the 40s, while also trying to go against the grain of what she was meant to do for gender roles back then, and go against the patriarchy, and be her own symbol that people could look towards. This is probably the best attempt for Marvel TV actually fitting within MCU canon, with how it's a prequel set in the 40s, it doesn't have that need to constantly catch up with what the movies were doing at the time, and so it could actually fit comfortably within the early MCU timeline. And it would also mark the first time when an actor from Marvel TV originally would actually make their way into a legitimate Marvel Studios project. Before Charlie Cox, before Vincent D'Onofrio, before Anson Mount, there was James D'Arcy, the actor that played Edward Jarvis in the series, being a precursor and inspiration for the AI Jarvis that we would see in the early Iron Man films, before being turned into Vision, would have a monkey as a cameo in Avengers Endgame, whenever Tony and Steve go back to the 70s 
to retreat to Tesseract and some pin particles, where Tony would find closure with his dad. Not to mention several other actors from Captain America First Avenger did pop in Agent Carter, and just small cameos here and there, that would make the world feel more fleshed out. But, the show was canned after only two seasons on the air, with more story clearly being set for more seasons. And because this isn't a Marvel Studios project, I highly doubt they'll ever go back and finish off this story. And doesn't really make it a satisfying watch when the story's cut off at the knees. So it's just best to watch the Agent Carter one-shot, which is really all you need to know about Peggy's life after Steve. Following that, Marvel TV made a deal with Netflix to produce several more adore-oriented shows focused on the Defenders, which was Marvel TV's biggest attempt to make their own side of the universe within the MCU, similar to what Sony's doing now with their Spider-Man less Spider-Man universe, which we'll talk about later. Producing a series of varied projects from beloved shows like Daredevil, which that will get into great detail later, and also shows like Iron Fist, which, yeah, it exists, I guess. But regardless, the formation of Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist led to the Defenders miniseries, which was their culmination, their Avengers if you will, for Marvel TV. There were plans to build outside these four heroes, including a Punisher series that was greenlit and lasted two seasons, but due to rights issues with Netflix and Marvel expiring their contract, and Marvel not wanting to renew it, led to several of these shows being cut off at the knees with not much closure, beyond Jessica Jones and Daredevil somewhat. And like Agent Carter, it's not like Marvel Studios will pick up these exact storylines, or we're making something entirely different on their own. So, the Marvel Netflix era came to an end in 2019. There were also a couple of misfits within the Marvel TV space, such as the Runaways on Hulu, Cloak and Dagger on Freeform, and most infamously the Inhuman series. Being the only announced project by Marvel Studios and Kevin Feige, so far, that was already cancelled after being announced, and then later being resurrected as a TV series. Which, the less said about that, the better. At least for now. Around the same time that these Marvel Netflix shows were being canned, it was all a ploy to fold Marvel TV within Marvel Studios in late 2019. And due to Kevin Feige's slate they had come in for Phase 4, and clean their own line of MCU shows with actually matter in the universe, and tie back into the movies, Marvel TV was essentially dissolved, and to just make an animated series and nothing more. The whole point in this history lesson was to show you that the MCU really didn't care about extended canon stuff like Marvel TV, and as long as you caught up with the actual movies, you were okay. There were always winks and nods to the fans from the comics, but nothing that distracted you from the main narrative that was going on. It was simple, it was peaceful. Now let's talk about Phase 4. Phase 4 has been the most disjointed, oversaturated, and frustrating phase of the MCU thus far. Now let me say a couple things before I really dive into this section. I don't hate Phase 4. In fact, if you watch my reviews on all the Phase 4 movies and shows, which I'll leave a link to them somewhere in this video, I've enjoyed all of them to some degree. Well, except I Am Groot. That was just pointless and stupid. But other than that little series, I still have enjoyed all these projects, and yes, you could say I have rose-colored glasses on, but as someone who literally grew up with the MCU, and it's the main reason why I'm pursuing the film industry today, I'll always have a soft spot for Marvel, and will always be interested in the universe in some way, shape, or form. Doesn't mean I can't criticize it when I feel like it's making mistakes, though. This is my video after all. Getting back on track, I also realized that this is only one-third of the multiverse saga, and that's easy for me to sit here and complain about stuff that I have no involvement in, and don't know the full story yet. I also don't really blame any of the creative talent here, in the regards to how the MCU's been structured recently, including Kevin Feige himself. Since it's pretty clear to me that this oversaturation of the MCU recently is all due to Disney, wanting to make quotas and make investors happy, by making Kevin Feige and his creative team pump up more than they can handle, just to have content out for Disney+. Plus. I mean, do you really think an Echo series, an Ironheart series, an Agatha series, a Wonder Man series, a Marvel Zombies series, an I Am Groot season 2 are really integral to the multiverse saga? I don't think so. So, I just want to put that out there before diving in because I have a lot to say on this newest phase of the MCU. Let's start with the first project of Marvel's Phase 4 and WandaVision. The first tease into this multiverse saga that would bring us the first of several famous cameos from established actors as slight variants of Marvel characters they played years earlier. Our first culprit being Evan Peters, reprising his role as Ralph Bone. Oh, I'm sorry, Pietro, aka Quicksilver, from the 20th Century Fox X-Men franchise. Meant to be a tongue-in-cheek reference to how his version was played alongside Aaron Taylor Johnson's version as the character in the MCU. And in the context of the show, it's all about the fan service for the audience, and doesn't really make sense within the show. Like, if one is able to recreate Vision or kids from the ground up exactly as intended, why is Pietro played by a completely different actor? Sure, you could say it's because Agatha tricked her or something like that, but how is one not able to see through that immediately that that's clearly not her brother? And it's not like Aaron Taylor Johnson's on bad terms with Marvel Studios, as far as I know. He's been adamant on saying that he's been down to reprise the role ever since Age of Ultron. But since I guess he's playing the Kraven the Hunter now, it'll make things weird, I guess. But anyways, another thing that brings his cameo up is a sense of speculation. Evan Peters in the series isn't just a one-off joke for fans to get in nothing much else, like what Marvel used to do with the references. His appearance up until the finale of the show had people go wild with theories, 
that actually ended up being more interesting than the stuff we got in the actual show. So I'm thinking this was our intro to the mutants in the MCU, or some crazy stuff going on, like the Fox X-Men franchise was completely birthed out of Wanda, you know, splitting the universes up into two, like the whole House of N Normal Mutants iconic storyline, or something of that nature. Although it's just dubbed down to a joke in the end, it still remains a question in my mind, along a certain other cameo down the line, is the validity of the Fox X-Men franchise now being canon in the MCU. Sure, this might be a different person than the one we know from the Fox universe, but you wouldn't get anything out of these scenes with Evan Peters, or have a giant question mark over your head regarding his role in the show, unless you knew the history of Evan Peters in the Fox X-Men prequels. Like, imagine saying that with someone like a family member that has never seen an MCU film or TV show before, and isn't really familiar with comics or Marvel or anything like that. Would you make them watch a handful of the X-Men films alongside the main MCU timeline, so that they would get that excitement of seeing Evan Peters as Quicksilver again? Which, with that whole nostalgia bait, has been the driving force behind all these cameos. And again, it's not just a side thing that you can just brush off like seeing Jarvis in Endgame. Evan Peters is a main player in WandaVision, and it's not like we're going to see the last of him either. But his cameo isn't even the end of it. Our next major splicing and continuity wouldn't actually be in a Marvel Studios movie, but with Sony's Venom Let There Be Carnage. Specifically, the post credits scene that transported Eddie Brock and Venom from their fucked up Sony Spider Man Less universe into the main MCU timeline, where there's an actual Spider Man now. Now, to be fair, these Venom films have always had a sense that they were to cross paths with Tom Holland, given the style feeling like a standard MCU film was an extra adult element, you could say. Fuck this guy! <laughs> But this is another example of bringing a couple extra non-Marvel Studios movies, like the first two Venom films, into the main MCU canon, to where you have to watch it to fully understand our next, and biggest culprit of this entire list, in Spider-Man No Way Home. The crown jewel of Phase 4 so far, and the shining light at the end of the tunnel for so many hardcore Spider-Man fans, seeing their childhood dreams finally come true on the big screen, bringing in at least one major villain and the central Peter Parker from each of the previous incarnations of Spider-Man in live action. Well, almost all of them. That's right, Peter. I'm you, and you're me. And this is a god. This storyline hinges on you fully understanding and not watching one, not three, not five, but seven films outside the main MCU canonical timeline we've established so far to understand the story completely. Not to mention the Marvel Netflix universe bringing in Charlie Cox's Daredevil for the first time, which we'll get into later. This isn't like the other mention like with Quicksilver, whether I'd like a side roll or just a tease. This story hinges on you to fully understand it takes a Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield Spider-Man. Now don't get me wrong, I still enjoy this movie on the level that everybody else did, and cheer whenever these legends walk through their portals and stuff like that, but you're adding in so much extra stuff that people have to watch to understand this movie. On top of the post credit scene that carried on with Venom 2's post credit scene left off, where we see Eddie Brock and Venom being transported back to their universe, but also set Venom in the most ass backwards way possible in the MCU, which also solidifies that you do need to watch both Venom films to get this scene as well. But speaking of ass backwards continuity, let's jump over to Hawkeye. Now, as a well timed stunt in Marvel's release schedule, Hawkeye's final two episodes dropped around the same time No Way Home's opening weekend did. So, when Audiences got to see the return of Charlie Cox as Matt Murdock on the big screen, we also got to see the return of Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin on the small screen. Somewhat. This section I really want to save until we get to the next time we see it Matt Murdock on the MCU, to really sink my teeth into my thoughts of how the MCU is kind of making the Marvel Netflix shows canon. I think. I don't. It's. Again, it's, we'll get into it later. Our next big set of cameos would be in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, the immediate film that followed up No Way Home in the MCU. Now, the majority of the film is in a standalone territory, which does kind of feel off given the title of the movie, but we do get a set of juicy cameos whenever Doctor Strange is introduced to the Illuminati of the A38 universe. There are a couple of cameos that feature familiar faces from the previous MCU films like Hayley Atwell as Captain Carter, very much being a nod to the What If animated series, even though they're not the same character, and Maria Rambeau as the Captain Marvel of this universe along with Carl Mordo. But then we get to the canons that mix up the continuity in a wonky way. First off is Anson Matt returning as Black Bolt, a character that he played in the All Human Humans series I mentioned earlier. And yes, this might be a different version, clearly, but it does add on to my question of, if you're gonna make someone watch all the things in the MCU for the first time, so that they can get the most out of every reference, like seeing Evan Peters, Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, would you also make that person watch the Human series, so they can understand who the character of Black Bolt is and seeing that actor play the same character again? Not to mention his death scene is one of the most memorable aspects of Multiverse and Madness. It's just a really weird thing and that also carries on to seeing Patrick Stewart return as Professor X. Similar to Evan Pierce of WandaVision, you would have to watch those early X-Men films to get the most out of seeing Patrick Stewart returning, in some form, to the role of Professor Charles Xavier. Not to mention using the yellow wheelchair, which they blame not to the 90s X-Men cartoon, which may seem insignificant, until you realize that Marvel's making a revival as a continuation of the 90s cartoon, and even the theme gets a drop in here when he enters, and also gets a drop in Miss Marvel when, you know, you realize that Miss Marvel's a mutant. 
So is the MCU gonna make that X-Men cartoon canon within this universe to where you have to watch that entire series to get all the references and Easter eggs for the upcoming movies, especially Secret Wars? It just kind of boggles my mind. But not as much as seeing Jocker Zizky as Reed Richards. Now, from what we got of his take of Multiverse of Madness, I did like Krasinski's dialogue and mannerisms as Reed Richards, and he certainly looks apart for like an older, more weathered Reed Richards, but the film does a really bad job of introducing people that aren't in on the know of the Fantastic Four, and also the people who don't know why Krasinski was a fan casting for years on Twitter, to who Reed Richards is and what he stands for. Like for example, put yourself in the shoes of somebody who has no idea who the hell Reed Richards is or what the Fantastic Four is. Does Doctor Strange 2 properly establish who the hell Reed Richards is, what he can do, what's his personality, why is he the smartest man alive? All these things are thrown to the curbside just so we can see want to turn to him like spaghetti for shock value. I know some people walking in will be like, well, people should know by now that you should know Reed Richards and all the comics up before walking in. And first off to those people, this is a Doctor Strange film, not a Fantastic Four film. You shouldn't have to know all the bases of all these characters from the source material. And that goes for any adaptation beyond comic book movies. But also, the MCU didn't get to become the highest grossing franchise of all time because it just pandered the fans from the comics. If that were the case, the MCU would have fallen apart before the first Avengers film got off the ground. The Golden Days the MCU managed to balance good storytelling that was most appealing to audiences like me walking in who had no idea what the comic counterparts were, while also having fun references to the comics that people that understood the comics would get more out of. Like in the first Iron Man film where Rhodey's ringtone is a classic Iron Man cartoon theme, or seeing Iron Man as Mark 1 suit meant to be a homage to the first Avengers comics, or like the Incredible Hulk recreating the opening sequence from the Bill Bixby Lou Ferrigno series. Another minor examples like it that addresses the character's roots, but it doesn't stop the film dead in its tracks to be like, Hey guys, remember this person? You know this character? And nowadays with films like Multiverse of Madness and No Way Home, the film literally stops dead in their tracks to puzzle what's going on in the plot just so we can hold on for your audience reaction to get your blood pumped up. That dopamine rush of seeing a familiar face again, like seeing your old fling at your high school reunion. Well that resonates all a trick to high wonky storytelling, to get you distracted by seeing Jim Halpert with a four on his chest, and realizing that we should probably be focused on Doctor Strange trying to stop Wanda at all costs like the plot entails. And that's that about today's day and age of superhero films, and these kinds of validations of the fans. I don't think it's out of bad intentions to give the fans what they want, especially in the concepts of films like Infinity War and Endgame, that were literally the culmination of this Infinity Saga, seeing moments like Cab Wheeling Mjolnir, or other moments like it, that were something that worked because it was earned after so much time, and properly said within the MCU. But now, getting to see Kim as a beloved actors in these familiar roles, is what's saying a lot of these superhero films. Even outside of Marvel, I mean look at Black Adam. The entire press junket from The Rock and WB were all about hyping up the whole return of Henry Cavill Superman for that post credit scene, more than the actual film itself. And Multiverse Madness felt the exact same way, where most people were excited about hearing Patrick Stewart's voice in the trailer, then getting to see Strange and Wanda battle. And No Way Home exactly the same fate, with people being more interested in seeing the return of Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, rather than seeing Tom Holland trying to figure out how to solve this issue of the world knowing that he's Spider-Man now. It's getting to a point where the fans make out what decisions it makes into the movies. And to me, as a fan, we shouldn't have much of an influence over these filmmakers in these movies. Yes, fans should matter in some contexts, or every comic book film would be like X-Men Origins, to be honest with you. But, if it were up to the fans, we wouldn't have gotten Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark, because he was a washed-up actor at the time that barely anybody wanted to take a risk with. And the fans would have probably picked somebody like a Tom Cruise that was way more bankable. We wouldn't have gotten Chris Evans as Captain America, because all fans would have just seen Johnny Storm in those Fantastic Four films, and I've given the guy a chance. We wouldn't have any of these iconic Avengers in these roles had fans been the deciding factor. Remember, fans hated the cast in Heath Ledger's Joker, Robert Pattinson's Batman, Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. Sometimes fans do need to be proven wrong. And while fandom certainly has a place in the MCU and pop culture, it shouldn't be the make or break deal to get them excited solely based on the next big facial scene and post credit scene. Overcrafting an actual good story that stands on its own if you take out all the MCU connections and cameos. And again, you can't have fan service if it's executed well. Going back to Captain Mjolnir, that was clearly established in the previous Avengers films, so when you got to see Cap picking up that hammer, that dopamine rush feels justified, because it was probably built up and paid off within the confines of the universe's storytelling. Seeing John Krasinski as Reed Richards doesn't do Multiverse of Madness any favors, other than stop the plot to provide an in-joke, that only people that know the history of the Twitter fan casting will get. That if you watch the film and aren't clued into it, you'll have to find out on your own time why did John Krasinski show up at all. Especially before we get to our main Reed Richards of the MCU, which will be a really weird retrospect for somebody watching through this universe in 20 years. Especially John Krasinski doesn't return to play the character going forward. It's like if Andrew Garfield showed up in Avengers 1 to help the team with the Battle of New York, 
before he sold Tom Holland in Civil War. It's just very sloppy storytelling. And that myth that it cameo dopamine, similar to seeing your flea in the high school reunion, will eventually go away when the both of y'all returns to your normal lives. That borrowed time is exactly why the multiverse saga is being so much more rushed than the Infinity Saga. Because the basis of this era of the MCU is mainly about cashing on familiar faces that people want to see. But that can only lend this universe so far, and eventually people will start to see the cracks in the storytelling. And people are already voicing their opinions on Phase 4 so far, and they're not very kind. And people would want and are wanting more from these shows and movies than just cameos. That's eventually just trying to jingle your keys in front of your face like a baby to distract yourself from the bigger issue. And it's not like seeing a bunch of characters fighting each other on Battle World isn't exciting for me. I can't wait to see it on the big screen. But the way they're going about it, just putting the cart above the horse to bring out all these iconic Marvel characters and all their variants that we all love, it's fun in concept. But how far is the MCU going to go with it? Are we going to see the Tim Story Fantastic Four group in the mid 2000s? Are we going to see Ben Affleck's Daredevil, Nicholas Cage's Ghost Rider, Thomas Shane's Punisher, Eric Bana's Hulk, Wesley Snipes' Blade, Jennifer Garner's Elektra, Howard the Duck, the DC Universe? I mean, how far are they willing to go to bring every single live action Marvel character reappear in the MCU? And it's not like it's going to get easier with films like Deadpool 3 and Secret Wars. And it's not just having to watch so much more just to understand what's going on in the MCU timeline by itself. There's not even a clear path as to what films it shows you should be watching to get all the big reactions to these products. The biggest blunder being with the Marvel Netflix characters. And that's where we dive into our most recent big cameo in She-Hulk Attorney of Law. The second and final episode of She-Hulk's first season on Disney+, Plus, consisted of the proper reintroduction to by far the most beloved character of the Marvel Netflix series, the blind lawyer from Hell's Kitchen himself, Matthew Merrick played by the iconic Charlie Cox, returning into the Hispanics from the Netflix series. Kind of. This episode of She-Hulk is kind of the tipping point for me making this video, because above all else that the MCU has made retroactively canon like the Spider-Man films, like the X-Men films, Sony's wonky ass Spider-Man universe, this is the most unclear ass backwards way of reintroducing us to the Netflix lineup. Mainly because Marvel themselves are playing coy with the canonical nature of the Marvel Netflix series. This is my last thing for you. I mean, I, Daredevil's a favorite character of mine for years now. He's in the same suit as we saw on Netflix, the colors are different. I'd love to hear about changing that make is this a continuation what's it like to address that um yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, but it, it's very, um, it's it, it's very conscious and it's very much planned. Uh, that's cool. all I can say. Yeah. Despite so far bringing back the exact same actors to play these exact same roles, and acting very similar to the Netflix counterpart, at least with Charlie Cox, Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin not so much that we see in Hawkeye, but. All Marvel has done so far in the press is trying to make sure the audiences know that it's Daredevil in the MCU is not the exact same as the one in the Netflix series. Even going out of the way to tell the next Daredevil series, Born Again, very much making a statement there, and that's fine. Until you realize that not only is Marvel planning to bring back more actors from the Netflix shows reportedly, such as Kristen Ritter as Jessica Jones in the Echo series, which will also involve Daredevil and Kingpin somewhat, but also reportedly have John Burns or prize Frank Castle, aka the Punisher for Daredevil Born Again. But also that despite all the reports that these renditions of the characters will not be the same from the Netflix series, Disney went out of their way to acquire all the Marvel shows from Netflix themselves. It's not like Disney inherited these shows like Inhumans or Ace of the Shield and just plopped them on their service. No, they made sure that you knew that you could tune into these supposedly non-canonical shows as an extra piece to get more content out. And you can still argue that you don't really need to watch these Netflix series to understand the Daredevil that we know so far in the universe. But the whole point of showing them No Way Home was based on the audience reacting and seeing that familiar face again. Again, like 90-95% of the people that cheered Charlie Cox in No Way Home was because it was Charlie Cox playing Matthew Murdock. Not because it was just Matthew Murdock, and even in this episode, which I did quite enjoy, the episode makes direct callbacks to the Daredevil Netflix series, like seeing Daredevil fighting goons in the hallway, calling back to the best action scenes in those first three seasons, and even having the balls, the cojones, to play the Daredevil Netflix theme over Matt going, I'm Daredevil. Like the gold devil. I'm Daredevil. Man, stop playing for real. I'm not, I'm playing, man. <laughs> it just confuses me because should these Netflix series be a required viewing now during an MCU binge at this point, especially to somebody new to the universe? Because you would not get the most out of seeing this Daredevil and Kingpin again without knowing the previous Netflix versions. Retroactively making the first three seasons of Daredevil required viewing now. Not to mention watching that Defenders miniseries because it bridges the gap of where Matthew Murdock is between seasons two and three. Which by association would also make the first season of Jessica Jones canon, Luke Cage canon, and Iron Fist canon 
to understand that mini series. So by bringing Charlie Cox's version of Daredevil into this world, in order to get all the winks and nods to Matt, that I'm sure will be expanded upon the more we get of Charlie Cox in the MCU, you will have to watch at the very least seven seasons of TV to get all that. That's kind of frustrating, and at that point, I just don't get why not just make Born Again a direct continuation of the Netflix series. Because whether Marvel likes it or not, you would not get the same reaction to seeing Matthew Barnard on the big screen in No Way Home or in She-Hulk without having prior knowledge of the Marvel Netflix universe. And it's gonna be weird, considering it seems like all Marvel's gonna try to do is retell the same stories we got told in the Netflix universe, just not as R-rated. And that just doesn't seem appealing to me. I love the fact that we're getting Charlie Cox and Vincent D'Onofrio back in these roles. I just don't like the fact that it seems like they're gonna try to retcon everything that Daredevil Netflix series stood for in order to give their retelling of these iconic Matt storylines that were already done great. Which why waste your creative endeavors on that instead of just continuing what Netflix did? Another thing that She-Hulk did that poised me to make this video is similar to what I talked about earlier with Multiverse of Madness and No Way Home about Cameo Palooza. The show was banking more on seeing so many familiar faces from the previous MCU movies and shows rather than just being a show about, you know, she-Hulk. Most of the marketing focused on how cool it would be to see Mark Ruffalo back as a Hulk. The first time seeing him in the MCU since Endgame. Seeing Tim Roth returning as the Abomination minus the brief scene we got him in Shang-Chi. Wong of course returning for like the 57th time in Phase 4. Which I don't mind of course because you know Wong is God. And of course, showing off Daredevil in the final trailer. The fact that we're at the point where those things are getting people more excited about a show than the fact that it's the show starring She-Hulk herself speaks volumes on the level of storytelling that's going on in this recent phase of the MCU. Overall, without rambling on too much longer, the MCU has a giant canonical issue going on right now that has divided and distanced new viewers and pushed back old viewers from getting into the universe, or multiverse it seems like now. Rather than just having a core string of movies that tell the stories in a way that was mass appealing and easy to follow, that stood in their own merit, and didn't bang on seeing Kano's galore and having in jokes to stop the plot going on just to get a giant reaction from the audience. That dopamine rush for fans, in my opinion, is what's making the MCU crumble to what it used to stand for. Among other reasons, they're making the quality worse with this recent phase. I understand that not every phase 4 project has fallen victim to the multiverse cameo fest going on, but the big ones certainly are. And I feel like it would be a detriment to the MCU going forward, especially with the amount of movies and shows that you have to watch to catch up on the universe by itself. Not just movies like it used to be, but with the shows, the specials, the animated stuff on the side, and all the multiverse shenanigans that are bringing in so many older Marvel films require viewing to understand the universe, makes this canonical structure to MCU a lot more jumbled and messy. Just like the ending of Loki Season 1, seeing that timeline split in multiple varied branches. Seeing these to be the core timeline of the Infinity Saga just be all jumbled and messy, just so we can see every Marvel hero on the big screen, in one giant movie. And while that might be exciting for me personally to see on opening weekend, how long will it be until those cracks start to seem? Similar to what happened with Endgame a few years ago, where the hype has died down and people aren't calling it the best MCU film anymore, like they used to. It's not even considered the best Avengers film. And for how much of Endgame I still enjoyed, if you were to watch it isolate from all the hype that it came out in, it's easier to see all the faults in that film and I do feel like King Dynasty and especially Secret Wars will suffer the same fate, if not be way worse received than the previous Avengers films combined. Because simply, it seems like the next two Avengers films will base itself on those cameos. And with not having writers in the levels of Christopher Marcus and Steven McFeely involved in these movies, Marvel is suddenly fighting an uphill battle with these movies. And on rewatch, it's gonna make the MCU a lot more jumbled as to what you have to watch just to get the entire story of the multiverse saga. From the Fox X-Men films, that will definitely become canon when Deadpool 3 comes out, if not Secret Wars. We've already made the Spider-Man films canon from No Way Home, along with Sony's Spider-Man less Spider-Man universe. That surgically attached these movies to the MCU like the Human Centipede, leading them to god knows where in the future. Certainly the 90s X-Men series will play a role at some point. I already argue that Inhumans might be canon at this point with the Black Bolt and Multiverse of Madness. And there's even reports of characters from Age of the Shield making a return to the universe at some point. Not to mention the whole shenanigans of the Marvel Netflix shows. I just wish there was a happy medium to where the fans and the storytelling met. But sadly, we don't live in a perfect world. With companies that will use up this universe until the well dries up. And whatever this multiverse saga wraps, what's next to come? I don't envy the people at Marvel Studios for having to deal with the stresses of Disney. But at the end of the day, with all the projects we have coming up our sleeve, and the endless barrage of news with what Big Kami will see next in a future MCU project, I'm just left here asking myself, what in the absolute fuck is MCU canon anymore? But on the bright side, at least we have Morbius. Morbius, I got that. Harmonious, old rhymes, the best of Morbius. Yeah! Harmonious.